I don't want to pick on Meta here, but we're basically asking an organization that has routinely failed to regulate content on its platform adequately to now regulate this at scale. Welcome to the Artificial Intelligence Show, the podcast that helps your business grow smarter by making AI approachable and actionable. My name is Paul Reitzer. I'm the founder and CEO of Marketing AI Institute, and I'm your host. Each week, I'm joined by my co-host and Marketing AI Institute Chief Content Officer, Mike Kaput, as we break down all the AI news that matters and give you insights and perspectives that you can use to advance your company and your career. Join us as we accelerate AI literacy for all. Welcome to episode 84 of the Artificial Intelligence Show. I'm your host, Paul Reitzer, along with my co-host, as always, Mike Kaput. Hello, Mike. Hey, Paul. How's it going? Good. We are doing this on a Sunday morning due to travel schedules for the upcoming week. So it is Sunday, February 18th. You are probably listening to this at some point, February 20th or later. So hopefully if anything crazy happens on Monday, I don't know. I, I hope the AI industry just got the craziness out of its system this yeah. past week because it was a wild week. We have a lot to talk about uh, on this morning. Um, man, I, I just like, I, I don't know about you, but like Thursday is when everything kind of hit. Yeah. And I had four presentations Thursday. I had like a 7.30 a.m., a 7.30 p.m., a 1 p.m. workshop, and then like a 3.30 p.m. thing. And during the 1 p.m. workshop was when OpenAI dropped the video generation stuff we're going to talk about. So I just felt like, I mean, by the end of the day Thursday, I was so mentally fried. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I was like, man, I can't wait to do the podcast. We have so much to talk about. Yeah, yeah. So, so we have a lot to unpack for you. Mike and I are going to do our best to try and make sense of one of the crazier weeks in AI that I can remember. Um, but before we do that, let's get into the sponsor. So today's episode is brought to us by the Marketing AI Institute's AI for Writers Summit, which is coming up fast. That is presented by Jasper. It is happening virtually on Wednesday, March 6th from noon to 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we had over 4,000 writers, editors, and content marketers join us for the inaugural event in March 2023. So we are back in 2024 with an amazing agenda, state of, tools and platforms to use, implications on copyright and intellectual property, how to adopt AI plat writing platforms in the enterprise, uh, an AI in action demo session with Mike and Kathy. That's going to be incredible. Just an amazing day. It is a free event. There's a free ticket option, thanks to Jasper. Um, so you can go to AIWritersSummit.com, learn more about that, and we hope to see you there in a few short weeks. So Mike, let's just go ahead and get into it all because... Like we said up front, there is a lot to try and unpack here. All right, Paul. So first up, OpenAI has teased a stunning new text-to-video model. It's called Sora, and it's blowing up the internet. Sora is an AI model that can create realistic video from a simple text prompt. Now, what has everyone talking is the apparent quality of the output. Sora can generate videos up to a minute long, that appear to be incredibly realistic and smooth. MIT Technology Review calls the initial videos displayed by OpenAI as, quote, high definition and full of detail. And indeed, the demos so far we've seen look pretty stunning. Uh, they show scenes like a hyper-realistic scene of a woman walking through Tokyo at night and a really cool, vivid, realistic-looking movie trailer featuring an astronaut. Based on these demos, at least, it looks like Sora is giving existing video generation tools a run for their money. And honestly, it looks just night and day from where this technology was only a year, a year or so ago. Now, Paul, I don't think that there's a question that Sora is a huge deal here. Like it is blowing up the AI corners of the internet based on how good some of the examples they've shared are. We don't have access to the tool yet. So we're reliant simply on these cherry-picked examples, but they're pretty crazy. Regardless, it really seems like an insane amount of innovation in AI-generated video has occurred compared to just a year ago, if you look at what was being output then. Do you agree with that? Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so we've, we've been saying 
for a while now that 2024 was going to be the year of AI for video, that it just definitely was trending in that direction. And that seems to certainly be holding true so far because, you know, this isn't even the only announcement we've seen. We're going to talk about Meta's announcements as well. Um, but if you just go back to around this time last year, I was trying to remember the exact date. I didn't pull it up, but it was somewhere around February or March when um, Runway teased the future of storytelling, which ended up becoming Gen 2, which is text to video, which up until Thursday was, you know, maybe along with Pika, like there's been some other innovations in, in the last couple of months, but Runway being able to generate four seconds of video at a time from a text prompt was sort of state of the art. And then you could extend those videos to about 16 seconds, I think is the max length through Runway. And so we've talked a lot about Runway on this podcast before. I, I demo it all the time when I'm giving keynotes as a model of kind of where the video is going. So to go from that 16 seconds to a minute um, is pretty incredible. And and my feeling was the minutes seem kind of arbitrary, honestly. Like, mm. I, I don't know why they, I'm sure a minute is within their research, but it seems as though they can probably go further than that. So my initial take was, this isn't the chat GPT moment, I would say, for AI video yet. Um, maybe in part because it's not really available to anybody yet. But it, it doesn't seem like we're quite there, but certainly a milestone in um, in the advancement of AI video generation. I'm guessing, you know, based on OpenAI's past release schedules, you know, it wouldn't be unrealistic to think it's probably like two to three months out before we start seeing this built into ChatGPT or available as a standalone, but their recent history would tell us that this is probably going to get rolled into ChatGPT, although maybe that's a new pricing tier. Like you could start to see now how they can mm. kind of add these other capabilities where if you want video understanding and generation, you can actually like increase your, your pricing tier. No idea if that's what they'll do, but that was kind of my first take on it. So I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of speculation out there just given how insanely good this looks and like how fast the innovation seems to be progressing. Like it just strikes me. And I just have to ask, like, are we looking at a near future where you don't really need to hire someone to shoot video? I mean, it sounds a little crazy, but like yeah. we have to assume we're getting longer and longer hyper-realistic videos very, very fast. I mean, can't anyone just make something incredibly good for cheap? Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to be the case in the near term. Like, I think we've all learned not to say that won't happen. Like, we just don't know where this is going. But I, I mean, I'll, I'll dissect like a few key excerpts from the blog post announcement because I feel like OpenAI did a pretty good job. They didn't release a ton of technical details about how they did this. There's no like open research report that says here's all the training data. They didn't say what the training data was. But the, the blog post had some really interesting aspects to it. So first they say we're teaching AI to understand and simulate the physical world with the goal of training models that help people solve problems that require real world interaction. So teaching, like when a, th uh, a 3D animator or like a game designer or somebody builds something, they follow the laws of physics. Like the, the objects and the people, the characters, like follow the rules of physics in the universe. These videos don't. Like there, there are pieces of them that do, but then there are things that don't make any sense. Like it drops a glass and the glass doesn't shatter properly. Like it's not following the rules of physics. So that's one thing is like, they're trying to get there. They're trying to create something that can not only generate a minute or more of video, but can do it within the laws of the universe. Um, so then it says introducing Sora, our text to video model, Sora can generate videos up to one minute long. So again, the context here is right now, best in class is like four seconds at a time to maintain yeah. consistency within those. Um, but right again, the key aspect you mentioned, Mike, is it's only available to red teamers right now. So basically they're giving the powerful model to a very select group of people who are going to test this thing, find all the harms and risks, finds where it's going to go off the rails. And then they'll give grant access, they said, to some visual artists, designers, and filmmakers to try and understand the impact on creative professionals. They went on to say uh, it can generate complex scenes, multiple characters, specific types of motion. Um, and they claim the model understands not only what the user has asked for in the prompt, but also how these things exist in the physical world. And this is 
We're going to talk a little bit more about Jan LeCun in a minute at Meta. This is where the difference seems to be happening. Like OpenAI is saying that they're building something based on transformers and kind of this diffusion model that is actually in a way understanding the physical world. It appears to me, Jan LeCun says that's impossible. Like mm. every interpretation I have of what he's saying is they're mistaken if they think that that's what's happening. So they go on to say the model has deep understanding of language. This is, goes back to Mike, you and I have talked many times that language models are just the foundation. So they're saying that the fact that these things can understand language is a real key and it enables it to accurately interpret prompts and generate compelling characters and emotions and things like that. Um, they also say it can create multiple shots with a single generated video that accurately persists the characters and visual style. That's key because like the example here would be if, if they're following a character walking down the street and the camera pans past that character and then comes back to that character, it's very hard for this AI to generate that character consistently once it has disappeared in essence. And so they're saying that they're basically having these breakthroughs where they're able to not only generate that character, but maintain the consistency of that character as you kind of move throughout these scenes. And so to your question, can this replace, you know, video design and animation? No, because it, they're only able to do it in like limited environments where they're able to maintain this consistency. So it's not like you can say, hey, design me a video game. And it just mm -hmm. goes and keeps all these consistencies and follows the rules of physics. Um, they get into a little bit about safety and how they're, you know, they're aware that this could be used for misleading content, such as detection. Um, you know, they want to know when the video was made by Sora. They did talk a little about C2 uh, PA, which you and I are going to get into in, a, in a, another topic later on. Um, there was a couple other things I thought was interesting. They did talk about being a diffusion model, which generates video by starting off with one that looks like static noise and gradually transforms into removing the noise over many steps. I think that's like, we're not getting into the highly technical stuff here. I think of the diffusion model in essence, like sculpting. I don't know if this is even the right analogy, but when you start with a piece of marble and you like sculpt this thing out of it, think of the marble as like the noise. It's just like this thing. And out of that, you create the, the, the sculpture. That's kind of how I envision diffusion working. It's like you're starting with this very noise. It's just, it looks like nothing. It's just noise on the, on the screen. And it sort of diffuses down. It like, it pulls the noise away and it's left with this video. So following this model, they're able to generate entire videos all at once and extend existing videos and make them longer. Um, and then at the end, they, they noted that so Sora serves as a foundation for models that can understand and simulate the real world, a capability we believe will be an important milestone for achieving AGI. Everything with OpenAI always comes back to AGI. <laughs> um, a couple other quick notes. They did have a technical report, which again, if you're really interested in the technical side, go read it. They don't tell you a bunch about how they did it. It's just kind of like what it's technically capable of. So a few interesting notes here. They highlighted that they think this is a promising path toward building general purpose simulators of the physical world. Again, Jan LeCun may disagree. They do call out that it is capable of generating images as well, which makes me wonder how this and Dolly, their image generation tool, either eventually become the same thing or it replaces Dolly. I'm not really sure. Mm. They talked a little bit about um, a word that I think we're going to hear more about of patches. So we've talked about how language models predict words is actually they predict tokens, which are like parts of words. And we'll talk more about tokens in a minute with the, the Google announcement. What this model does is it, it basically follows a similar pattern, but it, it actually uses patches. So it's just a, a word you're probably going to hear. Um, and then one of the things that I thought was fascinating is they said, we find that the video model exhibits a number of interesting emergent capabilities when trained at scale. These capabilities enable sort of to simulate some aspects of people, animals, and environments from the physical world that it wasn't basically trained to do. So. This goes back to this idea of open AIs that if we just keep giving it more data, keep giving it more computing power, it seems to develop these emergent capabilities. Mm. Uh, but they also noted that it does exhibit numerous limitations as a simulator. And this gets into how I started. For example, it does not accurately model the physics of many basic interactions like glass shattering. Other interactions like eating food does not always yield correct changes. So I take a bite of the burger and there's nothing missing from the burger kind of thing. Um, 
So then the two, the two, two final thoughts here, I noted Jim Fan, which I, I think you had made note of, um, or you and I had talked about was he, he tweeted, if you think open AI store is a creative tool or a creative toy, like Dolly, think again, it is a data driven physics engine. It is a simulation of many worlds, real and fantastical. Um, which I don't even know that like it was hurting my brain to like read that tweet. <laughs> I've read it like 15 times and I just, I even used perplexity to try and like understand what he was saying. Uh, but anyway, he's saying it's something much bigger than what you think it is, is the synopsis there. Um, he, he equated it to the GPT three moment. So he's basically saying like, Hey, this isn't GPT four yet. This is about where we were with GPT three in relation to text generation. Um, and then the final one, I'll put a, a note in here is Jan LeCun did comment and he was kind of like, people were taking shots at him saying, oh, I thought you said this wasn't going to work. And here it seems to be working. And he basically was like, this is not what you think it is. So, um, he said the generation of mostly realistic looking videos from prompts does not indicate that a system understands the physical world. And this is going to be a theme throughout today's episode. There is disagreement from like the leading AI experts of how we move forward, what next generation looks like. But um, the final context from him, this is why he says the video they're trying to do isn't going to get us to the next level. He said, words or tokens are easy to predict because there is a finite number of them. Typically, there are about 30,000 possible tokens for text in any language. If you don't know the price of only if you don't know the price is only what a token comes next, you can produce a score or probability for each possible token. So in essence, what he's saying is as you're writing, as, as AI is writing things, there's only like 30,000 roughly variations of what could come next. And there's ways to kind of drill that down. So you, you, you have a probability of a few select words. So he's basically saying like language prediction is, is kind of easy comparatively. He goes on to say, but the number of possible video frames for all practical purposes is infinite, continuous and high dimensional. So he's basically saying like predicting a word is child's play compared to predicting what's going to happen in a physical world where anything can happen and you're trying to predict frames. And so he does not seem to believe that what OpenAI is doing is going to ultimately get to this AGI outcome, but they, they obviously disagree. So. I don't know. I mean, that's kind of my big overall take here is it seems like a massive leap forward. It's very obviously noteworthy technology. I think once people get their hands on it, it'll be really fascinating to see what it's capable of doing. They're going to have to red team this thing like crazy because it's going to, what we know from GPT-4 is it had all kinds of capabilities that were uh, nerfed out of it for, you know, a technical term. Um, which means safety, like nerf actually, like nerf guns, safety. So they made it safer and this thing's going to do all kinds of horrible things. Like if you ask it to, I'm sure, uh, depending on what its training data was and they're going to have to like, you know, protect it from doing that. I don't know, man. I, it's still like I, my head's still spinning. And again, all we have are open AI's outputs. So they're handpicking the best of the best examples. But even within those examples, I saw a great like takedown of each of these videos, like the one where the little monster was like playing with the candle. And this, this guy was an animator, like called out like 50 different things that were wrong with this 17 second clip. So to go back to your first question, will this replace anybody? No, like no time soon is this because it has. I mean, it, the equivalent of hallucinations in essence in language models, it's, it's just like hallucinating things that would never happen in a physical world that follows the laws of the universe. <laughs> All right. So in our second big piece of news today, we have some big announcements again from Google. Um, so if you recall back in December of 2023, Google announced Gemini 1.0, its most advanced model. Uh, with versions that uh, it lists as Gemini Nano, Pro, and Ultra. Just last week, we covered the company releasing Ultra 1.0 as part of its new Gemini Advanced paid subscription tier. And now, in a little bit of a surprise announcement, Google says that Gemini 1.5 is ready for prime time. So Google CEO Sundar Pichai in a blog post this past week wrote, quote, it shows dramatic improvements across a number of dimensions and 1.5 Pro achieves comparable quality to 1.0 Ultra while using less compute. 
the new generation of Gemini also delivers a breakthrough in long context understanding. We've been able to significantly increase the amount of information our models can process, running up to 1 million tokens consistently, achieving the longest context window of any large scale foundation model yet. That last part is important. According to Google, quote, this means 1.5 Pro can process vast amounts of information in one go, including one hour of video, 11 hours of audio, code bases with over 30,000 lines of code, or over 700,000 words. Not to mention this new model appears to have impressive, quote, in-context learning. This means it can learn new skills from information given in a long prompt without any additional fine tuning. So this was actually on display in one of the examples given by Google. They had the model learn this very, very rare language called Calamang, which has just 200 speakers all over the world. The model learned the language and how to translate it simply by using the context in a grammar manual. So pause. Kind of surprised how quickly we have a new version of the Gemini model and one that's apparently, at least in the version 1.5 Pro, comparable to Ultra 1.0, but uses less compute because we literally talked about Gemini Ultra 1.0 being released last week. Like, what were your thoughts here on how quickly this happened? Yeah, the, the timing was just so bizarre. So this, we talked about Thursday being a crazy day. This was Thursday as well. So this came yeah. out like 8 or 9 a.m. Eastern time, Thursday morning, about two to three hours before OpenAI dropped Sora, which I, there was a part of me that was like, OpenAI totally had this announcement just sitting here and was waiting mm. for Google to announce something, <laughs> and then they just like one-upped them just for fun. I don't know why else they would have both got announced on the same day. So I don't understand the timing. It, it does create quite a bit of confusion when you just came out with Ultra 1.0, and now you're saying we have a pro version Mm. 1.5 that's probably more powerful than the ultra 1.0 which by the way like literally just became available for developers so i don't know like i i, I don't understand it I, i've kind of taken a moment and tried to like figure out what is going on here on the timing but I, I don't know my one theory is like some other things are coming soon and they just needed to get this out from a timing perspective mm. um so yeah, that was my first take on the, the timing. The context you mentioned, I think, is so critical. And we already talked about like tokens um, in the previous one, but this this starts to you start to see a theme building here. So yeah, timing was weird. It's only available in a limited preview to developers and enterprise customers. So again, this isn't something you or I are gonna go run and try in our yeah. Gemini advanced account. Like we don't have access to it yet. Um, they said that the Pro, when it is available to the rest of us, will have a standard 128,000 token context window, which isn't life-changing. Like Anthropic, I believe, has 200,000 right now. So the 128 isn't anything major, but then they're going to basically allow you to, it sounds like, pay more to get the million-plus tokens or even further up. The other thing they stressed was that it is a mixture of experts' architecture and we've talked about that previously um, on on the show, but to recap here, this the they're not the only ones doing this, but the significance of this, like the way I always explain this is, like when you ask a question of a human and like the human answers you, they usually pull from, we don't know exactly how it works, but like every brain, every neuron in the brain doesn't fire to do each thing a human does. There are like very specific parts of the brain that fire to um, answer questions or take actions or whatever it may be. And so this mis mixture of experts architecture tries to follow a similar concept within the machine. So when you ask it to do something, analyze a video, analyze audio, and you know, you give it the input of a bunch of text that it only fires parts of the model. So historically the whole neural network, like the whole thing would fire to do a single thing. Now what we're able to do or what they're doing here is they're almost saying, okay, it's being asked to do this one thing. Here is the section of the model that is able to do that thing best. And we're only going to fire that. That allows it to be more efficient with the energy it uses and more efficient in its output. Um, I thought it was interesting. They, they mentioned that while a million tokens is what they're kind of like allowing people to have access to in this limited release, 
they successfully tested up to 10 million tokens in their research, which is kind of wild to consider. And then they explain, like, basically the bigger the context window, this, whether it's 128,000 or a million or, or 10 million, the more information that you can put into the prompt and the output can become more consistent, relevant, and useful. Um, they gave a few examples just to kind of bring this home and make it a little more tangible. So they said uh, examples would be it could reason across very long documents from comparing details across contracts to synthesizing and analyzing themes and opinions across analyst reports, research studies, and even a series of books. Now, Anthropic and others would enable you to do this. Like Mike and I do this sometimes. We'll give it re research reports and things. But what has traditionally happened with these models is the more context you give them, the more tokens you give them, the less accurate they kind of become as they go further on. So it becomes less and less reliable as you give it more context. What it seems like Google is saying is they're finding ways to maintain accuracy and reliability as you expand the number of contexts. Well, that becomes huge, especially in examples like this, like analyst reports, contracts. When you really start to think about knowledge work, we need to be able to trust these models and their outputs or else it's really just redundancies. The human's still got to do all the work to verify everything. They talked about another example, analyze and compare content across hours of video, such as finding specific details in sports footage or getting caught up on detailed information from video meeting summaries that support precise question and answer. So again, that they use this great example where they were like giving it a whole movie and saying, you know, find the part where the paper was taken out of the person's pocket and it finds it. And then it's actually able to tell you what, what was on that piece of paper and it's able to like see and analyze it. So, you know, in marketing and in business and communications and in sports entertainment, like media and entertainment, you can start to envision all these ways you could use this if this technology becomes really av available. Another one was enable chatbots to hold long conversations without forgetting details, even over complex tasks or many follow-up interactions. Mm. And then the last one was hyper-personalized experiences by pulling relevant user information into the prompt without the complexity of fine-tuning a model. These, to me, was like, this is buried within kind of like the technical side, like the Vertex AI stuff. But this, to me, was like, oh my gosh, like now you can look at the business uses of these, just those four I just went through. And you can start to think, what if chatbots became reliable? What if they were accurate no matter how long the thread? And what if they had memory about everything we've previously talked about? So knowing this is a 1.5 release, knowing they appear to have accelerated the announcement of it for some unknown reason, you can start to kind of piece together what Google is doing and where by later 2024, the implications to business and knowledge work will start to happen. Like when this stuff becomes truly reliable, um, it's, it's kind of like crazy to really start to step, like step back and think about. Yeah, it's certainly one of those things where we've talked a lot about kind of the future potential of these tools once they really get good enough at things like the in-context learning that Google has referenced here. And that just seems like we're starting to see the first glimmers of that actually happening. And I don't know if we're ready for it. Yeah. And the only other like just oddity I I'll note, because again, like it's so weird, like how the timing is happening. But yeah. Google's doing this weird thing where every time they make a major announcement about AI, they're doing a blog post from Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Alphabet and Google, and Demis Hassabis, who runs Google DeepMind. And this, I think this is the second or third time now they've done this with the Gemini models, which come out of DeepMind and the AI lab. But it's just odd to me that their, their, their format is, here's a quote from Sundar, and here's an excerpt from Demis. And they basically say the same thing. I don't know why they're doing that. And, and like, again, as you and I spent time in the PR world, like there has to be some strategic communications reason why they're doing that. Like it's no value to the reader. Like, just tell me the information. I don't like, just say it's byline by both of them. What do I care if it's broken up by this is what Demet says and this is what Sundar says, because I know the PR people wrote it anyway. So like, why are, I, I don't know. It's just, there's something there. I can't, I can't put my finger on it yet. Like what exactly the reason is, but it's not an insignificant thing that they're doing. It's a very intentional choice that um, is either laying the groundwork for something with, but mm. it's just interesting to have Demis constantly be on that level, just one right below Sundar, but intentionally keeping them together in these announcements. So the, 
I, what I'm telling you is I think at some point something is going to happen and we will look back and be like, ah, that's why they were doing that. Um, I have some theories, but I'll hold off on those for now. <laughs> All right. And our third big topic for this week, it's becoming harder and harder to tell what's real and what's not online. Thanks to hyper-realistic deep fakes and synthetic content generated by AI, all of which we've highlighted as a problem many, many times. Well, it turns out leading AI companies, even some AI rivals, are coming together to at least make some type of attempt to address this problem. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, Meta, OpenAI, and Google have announced that they're going to join companies like Microsoft, Adobe, and others in embracing something called content credentials, which is a technical standard for media provenance from C2PA. Now, C2PA is a standards organization. The name stands for Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. And this organization is bringing together these companies and leaders to work on ways with over 100 companies so far to identify where content actually came from online. So the C2PA standard, which is named after the organization, uh, basically has, gives publishers and companies the ability to embed metadata into media to verify that media's origin. So this metadata could be used to see, for instance, if an image was created with an AI tool when you view the image online. For example, you can now view additional metadata in any image generated by ChatGPT using DALI 3 or the OpenAI API. And it'll actually tell you, okay, this was AI generated. Here's what tool it came from and a bunch of other information. Now it turns out as part of this process, Meta appears to be trying to go one step further. So the company said that it's already using metadata to label images that are created with its Meta AI tool, but now they're quote, building industry leading tools that can identify invisible markers at scale specifically the AI generated information in the C2PA and other technical standards being used so that we can label images from Google, OpenAI, Microsoft, Adobe, Midjourney, and Shutterstock as they implement their plans for adding metadata to images created by their tools. Now, this might seem a little technical or esoteric here, but really what they're trying to do is come together to have a joint standard and effort to actually label AI-generated content online and actually detect when those labels exist, presumably, at least in Meta's case, to be actually able to regulate how those images and eventually video and audio show up on their platform. So I want to kind of first take a step back here, Paul, and just ask, like, why now? Why are these companies devoting resources to this, given everything else they're working on? Like we've talked about on the show so many times, I mean, my biggest concern for near-term AI misuse is disinformation, misinformation, synthetic content, because the average citizen has no idea AI is capable of doing these things. And so you see an advancement like Sora, and it's incredible, mm -hmm. but it's just one step closer. Even if, like when you watch the videos on Sora, you have to have a trained eye or be looking for the breakdown in the laws of physics. Like it's not obvious right away that things aren't working right. The, the person who's looking for it can easily say, oh, okay, that's, that totally isn't real. Like obviously that the thing went from five fingers to six fingers and then back to five fingers in like a blink of an eye, but it happened. That's the average citizen isn't going to do that. Like they're just going to see something there. Everything is in shorts now. Like they all just like quick videos of everything and you're not going to stop and process was that real or not so all of these companies are aware that the things they're building will be misused and are being misused and the the more advanced they become like advancements like sora um the more likely it is that this is going to become a major problem in society so this seems like in my opinion, at least initially, a good faith effort to address issues with deep fakes and synthetic content, largely through smarter engineering, which is awesome. But realistically, like how feasible is it to tackle this problem in this way? I mean, the companies involved like Meta readily admit they have many, many caveats in their blog posts and announcements about this. 
that image labeling only works if all the major players actually do it. It's easy, apparently, to remove labels and watermarks, and it's not possible today to identify all AI-generated content. Like, for instance, I think largely this is happening right now with image generation, whereas video and audio are lagging behind. So how do you view that, and what are your thoughts on how likely this is to actually make an impact? I mean, the way I look at this is it's critical that they're doing something in a unified way or apparently unified way where they're trying to find ways to address this. I think it's authentic. Like, I think that they truly do realize this is going to be a major problem and they are trying to find some solutions. But it does appear that even this unified approach has massive limitations. So you know, you mentioned the metadata can be removed. People can just take screenshots of things and spread the, the screenshots. Mm -hmm. um, you can even take a screen recording of something and spread it and like it appears real. Like, so there's going to be limitations on a technical side. Then you need the social networks to be willing to detect and flag and remove this content. So we saw, you know, the Taylor Swift example with uh, Twitter X, where it was like 48 hours before they did anything about fake content that they knew was fake content that was spreading. So even when they know it, they still have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So then you rely on the distribution channels to do something about the fact that this content is real and that it's not just what, whatever we want to, you know, say it's like freedom of speech. That is like, whatever people are allowed to create deep fakes and spread them. What I, people are making arbitrary decisions around this stuff. Um, and then you deal with the fact that there's a whole bunch of open source capabilities. Like whatever Sora enables, three to six months behind it is going to be some open source model that can do the exact same thing and they're not going to care. And so I just, I feel like we have to make these efforts. The more people that are involved, the better, the more brain power and computing power that is going to solving this, it's, it's good, but I don't think any of it is going to solve this uh, in a very uniform way. And that goes back to what you and I talk about all the time is like the only true way to address this is through AI literacy, is to make people aware that this stuff exists and it's possible to develop very real looking videos and images and, and audio um, and that they can't trust what they see online, that the people have to be able to vet things. But that's a as a monumental task. Like mm. we live in a society where people want to believe what fits within their purview of the world, their political beliefs, the religious beliefs, whatever it is, whatever they want validation for, they will believe anything that validates their beliefs. And so if people can create images and videos and text and audio that validates what they want to be true, it doesn't matter to them if it was AI generated, they, they don't even want to know. They're just like, I just want to ignore that. And so I don't see a solution to that in society anytime soon. And so I think it's important that the technical side is doing what they're doing. I think it's important that more people drive AI literacy throughout society and combined, I think that's the best we're going to get, but just people have to accept that there is no solution to this like we are we are going to live moving forward in a society filled with misinformation disinformation and synthetic media that is spread through social networks regardless of what those social networks try and do to stop it um it it, it this is just the world we're going to live in and i think we just have to kind of like accept that and start doing our part with our own kids our own family schools um, businesses, like wherever you can influence, I think we just need to do our part to try and raise awareness around this and get people to be more responsible about how they consume and share information. It's, I, I, do you have any other thoughts on that, Mike? Like, I don't know what else to do. I, I really feel like that, that is the only real answer. Yeah, it, I completely agree because, you know, I, I don't want to pick on meta here, but we're basically asking an organization that has routinely fail to regulate content on its platform adequately to now regulate this at scale. So I appreciate very much what they're doing and I'm glad we're doing something, but at the end of the day, our ability to outrun this is impossible. So I think you just have to accept 
that we need to change the paradigm in our own mind about right. what is real. We basically move forward, assuming nothing you see online is real until verified. But that education, I almost wonder if it would be helpful at some point, like an industry association or something that's like running ads about this stuff, right? Yeah. There needs to be some sure. public service announcements around agree. what this technology is capable of. I want to see a Super Bowl ad that yeah. educates people about this. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think like, you know, just as we're talking about this, like, I don't even know that like legal solutions are, are, are the answer because you could, mm -hmm. You get into like is and this has been already I think litigated, but like are the social networks responsible? Do we have a liability for the spread of misinformation that does harm? Mm -hmm. The spread of deep fakes that does harm? Um, can they be financially liable, criminally liable? I, I don't know, um, but I don't even know that that's going to solve it. And I think that depending on which political party is in office, like again, I, I when we speak politically, it's like general awareness of like how the United States government works. Um, I think the motivation to do something about this is going to vary based on who's in office for four years. Right. And so I don't even think that's the solution. So yeah, I, I do. I think, you know, I'd love to see not only this, uh, C2PA, um, with all these companies buying, but I like your idea of like you as part of this, like each of you needs to put in $10 million for a public awareness campaign around synthetic right. media like that. Right. I, I think that's a great idea, Mike. I think like, Put your money behind this as well as your technical prowess and let's actually try and change the understanding across society because we're going to run out of time before the next election cycle we're in the next election cycle already yeah all right so diving into some of the rapid fire topics this week uh first up andre karpathy one of the founding members of open ai and one of its top ai researchers has left the company uh, in a post on X, Karpathy said that, quote, nothing happened and it's not the result of any particular event, issue or drama. He had nothing but compliments for the team. And he said his immediate plan is to work on personal projects and, quote, see what happens. In the post, he also hinted that his longtime followers might have a little bit of an idea of what his next project might look like. So, Paul, we don't know a ton here, but you have followed him for a while. Like, what do you think is going on here? I mean... Do you buy the story? Nothing really happened. Any ideas on what he might be working on next? No, I mean, I, I obviously, I think he'd be working on AI agents of some sort. Mm -hmm. He's a huge proponent of open source. The only thing that seemed odd to me in his time at OpenAI, and again, we talked in depth about Andre's last week's episode. So if you look, that's what was weird is this happened on like Tuesday. I think he announced, he told that OpenAI he was leaving on Monday. It came out on Tuesday of this week, this past week. And we had just talked in depth about World of Bits and his work on AI agents. We talked about open AI um, going aggressively into the AI agent space, which seemed to align with why Andres went back. So on its surface, it didn't make a heck of a lot of sense. There wasn't much other than like rumors and theories online. The only thing that jumped out to me, because again, he went back to open AI right around a year ago, the, you know, the day he left, it was about a year in February, February 8th, I think is when he started back at open AI and he left on February 13th or something. So he was back for one year. Um, he did that busy person's, uh, intro to LLMs, YouTube video yeah. and, over the holidays, which I thought was interesting because it was very clear. It was like, Hey, this isn't open AI, what were they working on? This is my understanding of what's going on in the larger research community. And there were some elements within that that I thought diverted a little from what he was working on or appeared to be working on at OpenAI. But the biggest thing to me is he is a, he appears to be a very big proponent of open research and open source models, which is not the path OpenAI is going down. Mm -hmm. And so it wouldn't surprise me if he did something more in that realm. I, I can't imagine he's going to go start his own, you know, AI. So he could certainly raise as much money as, as he wanted if he wanted to do that. Um, I don't know. I, I think he's going to work on AI agents, and I think he's going to do something in the open source world more so than what was happening at OpenAI. But it's perplexing. I'm mean, like, I don't know. And I, I other again, other than some theories, nobody seems to know, and he's not really saying much. And um, we'll see. Definitely intriguing. Yeah. There's probably some more coming out soon about him. Yeah. 
All right. In other news, Meta has announced that it's publicly releasing a model called V dash JEPA, V JEPA. It's an acronym that stands for Video Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture. Now that sounds like a mouthful, but it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. But it is important because V JEPA is basically a model that's trained on video data. And as a result of the way it's trained, it can efficiently learn concepts about the physical world. So it can learn new concepts and do new tasks using only a few examples. And this sounds like it kind of gives the model the ability to learn more like a human would by simply observing the world. Now, according to Meta VP and Chief AI Scientist Jan LeCun, quote, VJEPA is a step toward a more grounded understanding of the world so machines can achieve more generalized reasoning and planning. Our goal is to build advanced machine intelligence that can learn more like humans do, forming internal models of the world around them to learn, adapt, and forge plans efficiently in the service of completing complex tasks. Now, right now, this model is open to researchers under a Creative Commons non-commercial license. So, Paul, this definitely seems to have some relation to what we saw with Sora. Um, we have Lacoon basically saying, uh, that these are designing machines to have more generalized reasoning and planning. And this becomes a little interesting when you start thinking about how this might relate to Meta's wearable AI products and efforts, like the Ray-Bans that they are selling now and other things they might be building. Um, the ability to learn from visuals and reason on the fly as you navigate the physical world could be at play here. What were your thoughts about uh, VJEPA? So couple thoughts, I guess. Um, one is very technical. Like, I mean, this isn't like the average marketer or business leader is going to go in and read this stuff and, and really have a deep comprehension of what in the heck they're talking about. Yeah. I think it's, it's always important to come back to the bigger picture, which is Jan LeCun does not subscribe to the open AI and appearing to be Google approach to throw more training data, more computing power, build more data centers, get it more NVIDIA chips and just keep brute forcing intelligence through language models and transformers and diffusion models. Like he, he doesn't believe that. And so it's interesting a lot of times because it seems like Meta is doing a lot of that. Like they, they have teams within the AI research lab that he runs that are doing things with language models and diffusion models. And yet he believes that like we need some scientific breakthroughs to get to the next level, to, to, to learn the way a child would learn, which is kind of like, if you ever listen to him do talks, it's what he talks about. He's like, you know, a two-year-old, a toddler doesn't learn the way we're brute forcing these things to learn. They learn mm -hmm. through a worldview. They observe the world. They understand how physics works. They understand gravity. Like they, they learn to understand time and space and the things around them um, and how to interact with those environments. And so he doesn't, believe that just brute forcing large language models will get us to that toddler level understanding of the world basically. And so he's done some talks that honestly, I have tried very, very hard to understand what he's saying. And it's, it's very complicated. Andrej Karpathy is like wonderful at simplifying his concepts and like, you know, it's kind of tangible. Jan is just like brilliant and, yeah. and sometimes it's really hard to comprehend what exactly he's saying, but that's my general takeaway is when I try and simplify it down, a toddler learns through observation of the world around them and they learn to understand a world model and they can interact with that world. Machines can't, and he doesn't think the way that it's being done in some of these other research labs is going to get us to that toddler level capability. And so this. I think, you know, it might be six months, 12 months, two years before what we're talking about here finds its way into some meta product or some leads to some breakthrough that all of a sudden it's like, oh, meta was right there. Mm -hmm. they, they did need this to get a worldview and here's how it's happening. Um, but even like Elon Musk tweeted in reply to this, he's like, oh, we've had the ability to do these worldviews for over a year with Tesla full self-driving. It's like, oh my God, like I can't even <laughs> go this route. So I, my main takeaway here is it's really technical. It's, it's cool to kind of like know this stuff is happening. Uh, I think it's really important people understand there are different beliefs and approaches being taken to get the leap forward in general intelligence. Um, and this is one of them to 
kind of keep, you know, in the back of your mind, I guess. So we also got an announcement that OpenAI is testing giving, giving ChatGPT a memory. So this means ChatGPT will be able to remember things you discuss across all of your chats so you don't have to repeat information. The way they describe this working is that as you chat with ChatGPT, you can ask it to remember something specific or let it pick up details itself. ChatGPT's memory will get better the more you use it, and you'll start to notice improvements over time. You can also control what it remembers and forgets or turn off this feature entirely. So some examples provided by OpenAI that I thought were pretty interesting for our world of how you might benefit from this include things like ChatGPT could remember your tone, voice, and format preferences, then automatically apply those to your blog post drafts every time you write one. It could remember your preferred programming language and frameworks when generating code for you. Or it could remember, say, the format and outputs required for a monthly business report that you use it to pull regularly using your company's data each and every month. Now, this memory feature right now is rolling out to a small portion of ChatGPT free and plus users, according to OpenAI. And they said that they'll share plans soon about a broader rollout. So Paul, the first question that kind of comes to mind for me here when hearing these new capabilities is one, they're awesome. This sounds really interesting, but does this undercut some of the capabilities of other startup AI tools in the ecosystem? Like Often a selling point of some of these tools is they can learn your brand voice, your tone, mm -hmm. your style, customized to you. That sounds like it's now just a feature of ChatGPT. Yeah, I think that's right. And and honestly, like I haven't really spent a ton of time thinking deeply about this one yet, but there's a reasonable chance this is the biggest news of the week. Like mm -hmm. as a prelude to what they're going to do with this and a prelude to building AGI, this is a critical step. Um, so I think this will have very tangible implications to users like temporary chat versus, yeah, go ahead and remember this. It'll play out into, you know, we've talked numerous times about these truly virtual uh, intelligent assistants where like Surrey and Alexa and Google Assistant and in theory, you know, open eyes chatbots or inflection pie that for them to become your true personal assistant and be truly intelligent, they have to remember everything. Mm -hmm. Um so memory is absolutely like essential to where they they want to go with general intelligence. But on the page where they announce this, it even gets into team and enterprise customers. So it says yeah. for team and enterprise um, can learn style preferences, as you alluded to, build upon past interactions to save you time. And then it bullet points like they can remember your tone, voice and format preferences, automatically apply them to blog post draft without needing repetition. Um, when coding, it'll remember, you know, preferences of subsequent tasks and streamline process for monthly business reviews. You can upload your data to chat GPT and it creates your preferred charts with three takeaways each. Like, mm. yeah, I mean, this is moving in a really interesting direction. And then it, it says GPTs. So the custom ones you can build yourself, like those can have memory too. So this seems to like not only be playing in, as you alluded to the startup space where in some cases, the differentiation is that you can train it on style guides and certain documentation and knowledge graphs. It, it seems like the direction they'll go, and I'm sure Gemini is going in the same direction with Google, um, is that you can just train it on these things and it'll remember everything. And that as the, you know, the context window we talked about earlier with Gemini 1.5, as its memory becomes greater because those 10, you know, 10 million tokens, which is probably where we'll be a year from now, but to remember better than a human level, because if you think about it, like we keep, we keep trying to pretend like these things need to be perfect because that's what we expect from software that it just, yeah. it's perfect. But the reality is like, Mike, if you and I watch a two hour movie, there's gonna be a whole bunch of things in there. I have no recollection of my 12 year old daughter has like attention to detail far beyond anything I have. Mm -hmm. And she will remember like little things from moving. You're like, remember when this happens? Like, no, I have no recollection of that happening. We just watched <laughs> that last week. Um, and so like to imagine, I think that there's a very near point where not only do they have the ability to have a million tokens of context or 10 million tokens of context, but memory that far surpasses human level memory of everything within those tokens in that context. 
And that's to me why I think this is probably the most important piece when you combine it with what we talked about earlier, ability to understand and generate video to, you know, understand audio, long research reports, you know, hundred thousand words, um, an instant recall of everything. Like that's crazy. Like when you really stop and think that we may be like one to two years out from one to 10 million tokens of context. And, and maybe it's like 99% accuracy of outputs yeah. that it doesn't hallucinate anymore. Certainly no more than a human would. Um, and I think that's the benchmark and that's where a lot of people look and say, do we really need AGI? Like, does it even matter? I've said this before. It's like, who cares? Like maybe they'll get to whatever they call AGI. But if we get to a world a year from now where for $30 a month, we have chat GPT team in our company. And it has access to all of our data, all of our videos, our audio, our images. And I don't have to go keyword search things. I can just talk to it and say, like, find me the video where Mike and I talked about memory and GP chat GPT and boom, it's just like right there. Give me a summary of like what we said when that happened. And it's like going through the transcript and the video and like, oh, what, what shirt was I wearing that day? Boom. You were wearing this like old PR 2020 shirt. Like this is. It's a wild thing when you really step back and think about what it would mean to have me inf almost infinite memory of multimodal, everything we have, and to have um, better than human recall of, of that. And I don't, I don't think that we're far off from either of those things. So it turns out also OpenAI has been busy developing a web search product that would essentially bring them more into direct competition with Google, according to reporting from the information who is citing uh, an unnamed source with knowledge of OpenAI's plans. Uh, this person also said the search service would be partly powered by Bing, um, but it isn't clear if this is gonna be separate from ChatGPT uh, or baked right into it. And Microsoft and OpenAI have both declined to comment. So this is certainly very much in the rumor phase right now, but very, very interesting to consider because it does seem like this could be huge if they pull something like this off. Because, I mean, at least from my perspective, the financial incentives are really interesting to me here. Google has way more to lose than Microsoft if people stop seeing search ads. Uh, Microsoft and OpenAI don't necessarily need search revenue to operate their businesses. Google does. Uh, seems like high reward for Microsoft OpenAI, high risk for Google here. Do you agree with that? What did you think when you saw this? I mean, it seems like an obvious play. It's so bizarre to me how everything Microsoft and OpenAI do appears to be competing with each other, and yet Microsoft owns like 49% of OpenAI, and I don't yeah. know. That relationship <laughs> is so bizarre to me. Um, perplexity, man, like they're, they're going to be like a hundred billion dollar company or yeah, open AI is just going to like replicate what they do in, in chat GPT. Like I don't if, if there was ever been like an all or nothing business that could like literally redefine search or just get obsoleted tomorrow. Like, I don't, I don't know, man. This is why I was like struggle so great. Like to in, like personal investing, like what startups would I even invest in? Like, I love Ooh. perplexity. Like you got me turned on to it after that episode we did. And I use it daily. Like it's, it's one of like the key pigs. But I could easily see Google just right. basically, you know, emu emulating it or making it better. And and I just start using Google because I'm in there all, all day anyway. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like you said, it's kind of like just the information has it. They're usually extremely accurate in their reporting, but there's not a heck of a lot to go on other than that. Certainly worth paying attention to. For sure. So in other news, a U.S. district judge in California has largely sided with OpenAI in three separate lawsuits about copyright that have been brought against the company by a group of authors that included Sarah Silverman, Michael Chabon, and Paul Tremblay. According to Ars Technica, quote, by allegedly repackaging original works as ChatGPT outputs, the authors alleged, OpenAI's most popular chatbot was just a high-tech grift that seemingly violated copyright laws as well as state laws preventing unfair business practices and unjust enrichment. Now, we won't get into all the legalities and legal terms here. We're certainly not lawyers, but basically it appears a judge agreed with OpenAI that every one of these claims about ChatGPT's output all being an infringement of copyright 
were not actually the case. Quote, authors failed to convince the judge that OpenAI violated the Digital Millennium Copyright Act by allegedly removing copyright management information like authors' names, titles of works, and terms and conditions for the use of their work from training data. So all these claims and issues that authors had with OpenAI using some of this work in ChatGPT have basically been thrown out by a judge, except for the claim under California's unfair competition law uh, that OpenAI used copyrighted works to train ChatGPT without author's permission. So to kind of step back from this, we don't have an overall ruling here on whether or not OpenAI used copyrighted works to train its models. But all the other stuff around that claim that some of these authors were trying to tag them with, it sounds like a judge is siding with OpenAI. Um, so it kind of certainly sounds like we could see a future here where OpenAI ends up maybe paying some fines and we all move on, whether we agree with what they've done here or not. Like, what did you think of this ruling? I, I still are uneducated, non-attorney opinion. I, I still seems like that's the most likely outcome to me because I think these cases are going to take years to try. And by the time that we have any finality to it, like Supreme Court level finality, they'll be on GPT-8 and they'll have done it all through synthetic data and licensed data. And like all this stuff about was it or was it not fair use is just going to be irrelevant. And so I could definitely see a scenario where they just end up paying some big hefty fines and who cares because they're worth $5 trillion by then and you pay your hundred billion and move on. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I just, there's going to be so many cases like this and you know, this really happened, but it doesn't really mean anything. And I, I think we're just going to, it's going to be that ongoing theme. And again, like nobody knows. So anybody who tells you with high level of confidence, this is, or is not what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. They're just, just driving clicks. Like we don't know. They don't know. Um, let the, let the courts figure it all out, I guess. All right. So as we wrap up this week, Paul, you posted this week on LinkedIn about all these crazy advancements we saw in AI this week and how you're kind of personally thinking about AI's ability to create for us more time in our lives, in our work, in our personal life, et cetera. Could you maybe share a little bit more to close this out here about your thoughts? Yeah, I, I'll just read what I wrote because I think it just sort of speaks for itself. And it, it is like I was talking with my friend Jeff Roars um, about like time and AI and the impact it has. And it's something I've thought a lot about, as you know, Mike, like you and I have talked a bunch about this. And, uh, you know, the more and more we meet with, you know, company leaders who are trying to drive efficiency and productivity and, and looking for ways to increase profits and drive revenue and reduce the costs. And like these are the things that come up all the time. And so for my Maycon, if you're not familiar, our marketing AI conference we run every year, our Maycon 2023, the keynote I did, I, I ended with this line, and I'll just kind of read it and, and we'll call it a day for the podcast because I think it's just something good for people to reflect on. Um, so what I said at, the, at Maycon was part of the reason I began pursuing artificial intelligence 12 years ago was because I saw it as a path to extend time. I'd always wondered why time seemed to move faster as we got older. I realized, at least for me, that the busier I was and the longer hours I worked, the faster the days and weeks seemed to fly by. When our first child was born in 2012, I began to truly appreciate every second of every day. I knew I couldn't get more than 24 hours out of a day, but I thought it might be possible to slow those 24 hours down. I didn't understand exactly what AI was back then but it seemed to hold the potential to unlock productivity gains, which would allow us to redistribute the time saved and, lived, and live more fulfilling lives. What I've since learned uh, then is that AI on its own won't extend time for me or anyone else. It will increase efficiency and productivity at a scale we have never seen in human history, but we have to make the choice to use the increases to benefit humanity. Otherwise, we'll just fill the time with more work and find new ways to maximize profits at the expense of people. We have one chance to get this right. AI can give us the greatest gift of all, more time, or it can be just another technological revolution that expands our work, fills our hours, and leads us down the path of never-ending productivity gains for profits. 
we can choose to make the future more intelligent and more human. That is an awesome way to end this crazy week, which I'm sure all this news has people, you know, certainly excited, but also a little rattled with how fast it, things are moving. So that's just such a good reminder. Yeah. I think it's just good perspective. It's good for me too, honestly. Like sometimes I just go back and think about why we're doing this. Like, why did I pursue this path initially? And with that, I'm going to go spend Sunday with my kids. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Paul, as always, thank you so much for breaking down everything in AI this week for us. I would just encourage everyone, if you have not subscribed yet to our newsletter, This Week in AI, I'd highly encourage you to do so. Go to marketingaiinstitute.com forward slash newsletter to sign up. We break down both the stories we just discussed even further and all the ones we don't have time for in a podcast episode. And there's usually at least half a dozen other things going on that you should know about. So This Week in AI is a comprehensive digest that you can quickly read to learn everything you need to know that's going on in AI this week. All right. Thanks, Mike. Everyone, we'll talk with you again next week. Have a great week. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for listening to The AI Show. Visit marketingaiinstitute.com to continue your AI learning journey and join more than 60,000 professionals and business leaders who have subscribed to the weekly newsletter, downloaded the AI blueprints, attended virtual and in-person events, taken our online AI courses, and engaged in the Slack community. Until next time, stay curious and explore AI.